Thank you. Thank you, Jérôme. Um, um, I won't stand in front because I want you to see the pictures I will show you. And I'm sorry, I'll read my paper because first I had to translate some text, Chinese text in, into French and then from French into English. <laughs> I'd better read them. Um, the paper I'm going to talk about is relevant or the first set of questions of the workshop. How to explain the hold that paintings have on us? What does an artist transmit through the artist's facture? Jérôme has asked me um, to give a review or to set a light on the research of Chinese calligraphy concerning the expression of emotions. So I, so I shall first review the researches in the field of aesthetics in the early 20th century, especially concerning the expression of emotions and on empathy. Then we shall examine the question of the brushstroke in modern and contemporary Chinese philosophy chiefly Gestalt psychology and psychoanalysis, before giving an overview of studies in calligraphy in the field of neuropsychology at the beginning of the 21st century. Now, let me quickly recall the place of the expression of emotions in Chinese traditional calligraphy. For the Chinese, painting and calligraphy share a common origin. Calligraphy is actually the art of writing. It's an art since at the beginning of the Christian era and closely related to Chinese painting because it makes use of the same tools, namely the supple brush and not the hard brush, the supple brush displaying ink on paper, silk or whitewashed walls. It's traditionally believed the brush stroke, which defines Chinese painting, can express all emotions. Oh, this is a painting of uh, um, contemporary Chinese painter, maybe the most well-known Chinese painter, and he uses the brush just like a calligrapher, and he's not a calligrapher, he's a painter. Now, the Chinese treatises on calligraphy do not have a scientific purpose. They are made for the practitioners of the art. Nevertheless, there exists an interesting theory. Its content concerns for a large part the description of emotions that are considered transmitted by the brush and also the visual effects of the brush strokes. Now, we must distinguish um, the, ex the expression of emotions on the one hand from the reception of the visual effect of the brush stroke by the beholder on the other hand. Although this morning, um, Alain Berthaud said um, actually it's the same thing, but um, the Chinese distinguish both. So, for instance, this is uh, calligraphy by um, a friend, a contemporary calligrapher, Chen Shistian, and he, um, well, calligraphers admit this kind of calligraphy can express a universal emotion. Here it's solitude, and which is uh, expressed for a practitioner by uh, the sparse dots. Another example by the same calligrapher, the character Yun, oh, this is a character which means solitude, uh, and this is the character Yun, which means the cloud. It's heavy. Um, as we shall see in the paper, Western aesthetics is mainly consumed by the reception of the visual effects, whereas Chinese aesthetics chiefly matters about the expression itself. Um, we can say the questions before us right now also concern, in a certain way, the Chinese traditional calligraphers or painters, even though the reflection they could develop is, of course, of a completely different kind as they use methods that cannot be compared to us. Calligraphy, shall I recall, is the art of the stroke, hua. Hua is also the term that means painting in Chinese. Its etymology is to trace the limits of a field with an instrument, it's not to display colors. And the strokes, especially the brush stroke, is not a line, but as I I already have explained this, um, this difference um, elsewhere. I will not talk about this again. Now, the brush stroke is the visual element through which the beholder recreates or re-experiences in his mind, the Chinese say in his or her heart, the gesture of the stroke. It's um, like a hunter who is able to reimagine the trajectory of an animal starting with, with its tracks 
But the difference is the hunter does not have to live the experience of the animal, while the beholder of the calligraphy does experience in his heart, I use Chinese terms, the gesture of the calligrapher. Now, um, we'll see the first point is emotion and empathy. This capacity to re-experience the gesture of the one who has done the brushstroke is explained by a great number of 20th, 20th and 21st centuries authors, Chinese authors, by the concept of empathy, a term attributed to the German philosopher Theodor Lips and translated by Yi Qing in Chinese, literally transfer of emotions. This is uh, in several, in many books. This empathy very shortly means that in looking at the brushstroke, the practitioner of a calligraphy can, by using his or her memory, his or her imagination, he can re-experience, imagine the gesture produced by the one who has traced the brushstroke and re-experience it in his heart or mind. Now, today I'll just talk a bit about uh, lips, just to recall what uh, he means to the Chinese. Today, um, Theodor Lips is remembered as the father of the first scientific theory of Einfühlung, which was uh, um, pointed out this morning by Alain Berthoz, um, which is translated by feeling into empathy, although the term has earlier been coined by Robert Fischer in 1873. Unlike his predecessors, Lips um, used the notion of Einfühlung to explain not only how people experience inanimate objects, but also how they understand the mental states of other people. From translating Hume's A Triotize of Human Nature into German, Lips had learned the concept of sympathy as a process that allows the contents of the mind of man to become mirrors to one another. Einfühlung, according to Lips, entails fusion between the observer and his or her object. For Lips, the unconscious process of Einfühlung is based on the natural instinct and on inner imitation. He used the example of watching an acrobat on a tightrope and suggested that perceived movements and effective expressions are instinctively and simultaneously mirrored by kinesthetic strivings and experience of corresponding feelings in the observer. Lips' introspection approach was ultimately eclipsed by experimental psychology and early behaviorism, which became far more influential during the first half of the 20th century in Europe. Nevertheless, Lips' thinking inspires such philosophers, we saw this this morning, such as Hassel, Dilthey, Weber, Edstein, etc. In 1909, Edward Titchener translated Einfühlung as empathy, um, as you can see here. Although considered speculative in his time, Lipp's theory of inner imitation may find some reflection in present day concepts of emotional contagion and perception action models of empathy um, in a paper written by Preston and Duval, Empathy, its ultimate and proximate basis. Another um, European aesthetic theorist has been very important to the Chinese. It's Vernon Lee. She was also a novelist and a literary critic, and um, she used the term empathy as soon as 1913. Her aesthetic theory advocates a kind of knowledge that dissolves two interrelated sets of boundaries those between past and present, and those between individuals. Late 19th century psychologists and aestheticians were fascinated by the study of psychological and physiological aspects of aesthetic response, and Vernon Lee was a major participant to this venture. Working outside the academy, Lee conducted informal experiments with Clementina and Trosser Thompson, recording changing, uh, changes in respiration, balance, emotion, and body movements in, re in response to aesthetic forms. In fashioning her aesthetics of empathy, she in mind a wealth of psychological theories of the period, including motor theories of mind, 
psychological theories of emotion, evolutionary models of usefulness of art, and, most prominently, the empathic projection of feeling and movement into form. She distributed questionnaires, contributed to scientific journals, carried out her own introspective studies and debated aesthetics with le leading psychologists. Lee's empiric empi uh, sorry, empirically based empathy theory of art was a significant contribution to debates on psychological aesthetics at the outset of the 20th century, especially to the Chinese offering an, a synthesis of Lipp's mentalistic influence and sensation-based imitation theories of aesthetic response. In China, Wang Guowei closely studied German idealism. In many respects, he is a typical traditional Confucian intellectual. He committed suicide in 1927 when the revolutionaries arrived in Beijing and he he wanted to remain Chinese, and for that he committed suicide. So I say he is really a, a Confucian, pure Confucian intellectual. So actually he was at the same time a forerunner in the reception of Western philosophy and aesthetics. He is perhaps best known for his elaboration of the notion of the aesthetic realm, Jingjie. Deeply rooted in Chinese traditional poetics, he explains his theory of the poetic state or poetic realm or aesthetic realm Jingjie, in his remarks on lyrics in the human world, Ren Jian Si Hua, written in 1908. This is a quotation. So sorry for the translation. So I hope it's uh, understandable. The realm does not only refer to a landscape or scene. The emotions of joy and anger, sorrow and pleasure, also constitute a sort of aesthetic realm, Jingjie, in the human heart. So if one captures in a poem a real scene or a real emotion, it is said to convey an aesthetic realm. If not, it has no aesthetic realm. Despite the clear influence of Western thought on Wang's critical framework, um, in his adoption of such notions as subjectivity and objectivity, for example, for the emotion and the scene, he himself explains this crucial expression of Jingjie by citing lines of poems that either have or convey an aesthetic realm or do not, clearly relying on his audience's shared knowledge of added aesthetic values. Thus, although Wang speaks about poetry, we can interpret his thought for calligraphy or for painting. And actually, his thought has been interpreted for calligraphy and for painting until now. He distinguished between what he called the aesthetic realm of the poet and the aesthetic realm of the ordinary person, pointing out that, and this is uh, maybe an answer to what uh, David Davis just uh, presented this a moment ago, or a kind of uh, continuation. And he says, only poet can sense the aesthetic realm of the poet. Only the poet can create it on paper. This is why when one reads a poem, one has a sense of exaltation and of leaving the world behind. Ordinary people can all feel the sad feelings of separation the joy of reunion, the homesickness of the traveller, but only the poet can put these things on paper. This is why the poet affects people so deeply and on such a broad scale. In other words, poetry or calligraphy or painting expresses an experience of life that is shared by a poet and ordinary person alike. This experience becomes an artistic, aesthetic realm when emotional responses to life are given verbal expression in the objective form of objects, poems, calligraphies and paintings. Thus, the aesthetic realm originates in the emotional experience of life, which is then transformed into an artistic subject 
This subject consists of the correspondence between the realm of human life and experience on the one hand and psychological emotions on the other. What Wang Guowei is referring to here is the objectification of psychological emotion in order to construct an artistic object that manifests something about human life. Wang Guowei speaks of poems that approach their subject in a manner that is mediated, ge, which means abstraction, separation, to separate, or unmediated, buke, when he speaks of the difference between describing and creating an, an aesthetic realm. But it's not exactly purely in terms of the interaction of emotion or feeling and see. This interpretation of Wang Guowei's concept of aesthetic realm, especially his emotion and scene theory, Qingjing Guan, uh, Qingjing Shuo, has been compared to Tear the Lips or Vernon Lee's empathy theory, Qingjing Shuo. They might be easily taken for similar theories, and they have been taken for similar theories, as they both concern the relationship between motion and object. But actually, Wang is concerned by creation, whereas Lips studies the appreciation. Wang is at the source, Lips at the reception. Thus, Wang Guowei's obstruction or mediation can be caused by the poet's indulgence in personal feelings or emotions and a rhetorical ornamentation, whereas non-obstruction or unmediation happens when the poet is moved to express himself in terms of transcending immediate personal and spatial-temporal spatial concerns. Wang Guowei, in fact, rejects individual and sensual emotions. Therefore, he states, in the aesthetic realm of which I speak, there is no hope, no terror, no inner struggle, no profit or loss, no self or other. And there is adherence to moral principles without following the letter of the law. Um, after Wang Guowei and following him, another aesthetician called um, Zhu Guangqian is considered the founder of the study of aesthetics in 20th century China. His main writings, The Psychology of Tragedy, Bei Ju Xin on beauty, Tan Mei, the psychology of art, Wen Yi, um, Wen Yi Xin Li, Xin Li Xue, on poetry, Shi Lun, a history of Western aesthetics, Xi Fang Mei Xue Shi, and letters on beauty, Tan Mei Shu Jian, were all published in the 1930s. These books, as well as a series of translations of Western authors on aesthetics, gave a wider Chinese audience access to their ideas for the first time. Zhu Guangqian based his argument and analysis on some key theories of Western modern aesthetics and, as a result, effectively removed the feeling of strangeness of imported ideas by means of semantic transfer, conceptual comparison, and quotation of examples selected from Chinese traditional art theory and poetry. Zhu Guangqian employed notions taken in Chinese classic art theory, for instance, Qingjing Jiaorong, which means fusion of emotion and see, to interpret Lip's doctrine of Ain Fulun and of Chao Ran Wu Biao or Chao Ran Wu Wai, getting out of the contingency of life for Bola's principle of psychic distance. Similarly, in bringing Kant's theory of disinterest contemplation and free beauty, with Schiller's theory of play and others in conjunction with Taoism, um, Chinese philosophy of Taoism, Zhu proposed an important theory of artisticized life. Thus, for Zhu Guangqian, aesthetic ex experience is a non-rational intuition of form. It involves both empathy and distance. Empathy because the artist loses self-awareness and becomes at one with the universe when he creates. But this oneness 
with the universe is itself achieved only by keeping a certain distance. This distance means a kind of disinterest in his, um, in his books. He says, if one looks at a calligraphy with disinterestment, then the viewer can absorb its savour without noticing it. This, without noticing it, is the realm of empathy for Duguantian. And he also states that calligraphy is the expression of one's emotion and character. Zhu Guangtian wanted to complement modern aesthetics deficiencies with Chinese tradition contribution. His contemporary, Zong Baihua, used Western modern aesthetics to reinterpret Chinese tradition, which is exactly the reverse. In other words, Zong Baihua did comparative aesthetics to reinterpret Chinese tradition. Thus, he referred to empathy when speaking about calligraphy, comparing it to music or dance, saying that it's an art of momentum and rhythm. For him too, calligraphy is the expression of the emotions and of the character of a person. I'm sorry. Um, that's what he says in his a Promenade in Aesthetics, in the chapter called Aesthetic Ideas in Chinese Calligraphy. Um, this, uh, these papers in this book, um, A Promenade in Aesthetics, has been, have been written between 1920 and 1979. The book published in 1980. Now, the next generation of uh, Chinese scholars, like Xiong Bingming or Li Zihou, also make use of the aesthetics of psychology but in a quite different way. Li Zihou employs the concept of empathy in his The Chinese Aesthetic Tradition, Hua Xuan Mei Xue, but, he only, uh, but only concerning poetry, or in the expression we have seen already, fusion of emotion and scene, Qing Jing Jiao Rong, which means the aesthetic of merging emotion and object together. He is never concerned about calligraphy or painting, namely. Li Zihou is much interested by the question of expression and representation in Chinese aesthetics. It has been tempting for commentators, especially Western commentators, to suggest that whereas China, uh, Western aesthetics theories have been preoccupied with mimesis, Chinese theories have been preoccupied with expression. Li weights in against this oversimplification, showing that in fact, art and literature in China have always been expected to reflect or actually to be an organic ex extension of cosmic and natural realities in a type of imitation that is conceived of in a much more organic fashion than Aristotelian mimesis. Correspondingly, traditional Chinese expressive theories were never framed in terms of the expression of individual emotions. Rather, art was seen as a vehicle to the expression of universal human emotional realities. Unlike Zhu Guangtian, who is considered in China as the first great specialist of aesthetics and who promotes a kind of aesthetic idealism, Xiong Bingming never tries to explain Western philosophic or artistic trends to Chinese, nor does he have the goal to establish great metaphysical theories. As we know, Zhu Guangtian, who has studied in Great Britain and in France, has the merit to have presented Western aesthetics main tendencies to his compatriots. But he was very much criticized in the 19, Maoist, uh, 1950s because he promoted the autonomy of aesthetics, which implied a clear gap between the aesthetic sphere and life. And this, of course, could not be admitted by Maoism. Um, on the contrary, Xiong Bingming, who lived in France and who was li not living in China, unlike Zhu Guangtian, who stayed in China. Xiong, who is more concerned by art theory and by cultural philosophy than by aesthetics, promotes the practice of arts as a philosophy of life. Therefore, he does not much refer to aesthetic theories, 
and in his theoretical system of Chinese calligraphy, Zhongguo Shufa Li Ren Tixi, he only mentions Theodor Lips and Vernon Lee about the effect of the brushstroke by comparing it with the line in Cleese paintings. For him, in both cases, in the Chinese brushstroke and in Cleese lines, the beholder sees a living being, that's his terms, living being, which can be explained by his empathy. But he doesn't explain much more. Several scholars, sinologists, namely, use the term of empathy in calligraphy, but without explaining it at all. <laughs> in the case, um, uh, for instance, uh, Zheng Youhe, in her uh, History of Chinese Calligraphy, published in 1993, Although a chapter of her book is entitled Individualism and Aesthetic Empathy, she doesn't say more. Same thing for David Clark in his Chinese Art and its Encounter with the World. In his chapter on the body in Chinese Art, he states, Chinese literative brushwork allow its spectators to empathize with a piece of calligraphy produced even many centuries earlier, but he doesn't explain how uh, and why. So let's go to the second point, which means the brushstroke through the Gestalt psychology theory. Actually, the Western theory, which is the most successful in Chinese scholars' eyes, is the field, uh, especially in the field of visual aesthetics in calligraphy, is the Gestalt psychology theory, um, which is very well explained in Tsai Changsheng's book, um, which is called um, Research on Space in Calligraphy, Shu Fa Kong Tian Zhe Yan Jiu. The, um, the researchers mainly measure or attempt to measure the brushstroke's length, gradient, angle, their brightness, thickness, dryness, etc., due to the way the brush is handled and the ink, the ink used. Researchers such as Li Yudrou, uh, Stephen Goldberg, Zheng Songming try to select measurable elements in the brushstrokes in order to determine their visual effects according to Rudolf Arnheim's um, principles established in Art and Visual Perception, a psychology of the creative eye. The main practical use of this theory aims at determining the authenticity or the inauthenticity of a calligraphic artwork. But unfortunately, even if such studies are numerous, they appear to be quite useless for two main reasons. Firstly, they expect to arrive at general principles, but when they find such principles, those can only be applied to one artist. They cannot explain, of course, the mystery of creation, that's what we have talked about earlier, even with the best efforts, and thus can hardly be useful for universalizing tracing principles. Secondly, these theories are being used to try to authenticate artworks. But, as only few generalities are deduced from these studies, I mean generalities different from the ones that are already known and theorized in Chinese treatises. The authentication of artwork is not easier with such theories than with traditional theories. Therefore, they are not more efficient than traditional theories. For instance, it is obvious a uh, horizontal stroke, as you can see here in this calligraphy. This is horizontal stroke, so you have another one, here another one, and here another one, and here as well. Um, this is a calligraphy by Zhang Mufu, which is a model in calligraphy, 14th century. So, in order to, uh, this, the horizontal stroke, in order to be distinguished from the line, it is constituted by a beginning, a development, and an end. Beginning and end bear more ink, which gives an effect of dynamism. In order to give the visual effect of a promptly traced brushstroke, it is obvious the horizontal stroke has to tilt, has to be bent. The more it is bent, the more it looks written promptly. It would be much too long to develop here all the principles that are required when one learns Chinese calligraphy consciously 
and deliberately, and that are implemented or opposed to during the artistic cre uh, calligraphic creation. Some of these effects are considered emotionally expressive. Though, if the authentication of artworks using the Gestalt psychology method is not more efficient than the traditional method and does not help much more, maybe is it interesting because it might be easier to understand for non-practitioners of calligraphy, namely in terms of facture, that was the question raised by uh, David Davis. Anyhow, let's take an example. For the 11th century calligrapher, Su Shi, in order to talk about calligraphy, one has to take into account five elements. The spirit, the energy, the bone, the flesh, and the blood. If one of the five is absent, it's impossible to talk about calligraphy. The bone is the structure of the brushstroke and of the composition of a column or of a page of characters. Flesh is determined by the quantity of ink, the thickness or the thinness of the brushstroke. Blood by the quality of the ink, more or less dry or unctuous. See, there is more, um, there is more flesh here than here, for instance. These three elements are tangible ones. They can effectively be measured. For these three elements, Gestalt psychology theory can be used. As for the energy, it corresponds to the dynamism, to the visual effect of the brushstroke. It can be attempted to be measured. But how to measure the spirit? It would be like measuring the spirit of a painting. It's fighting a losing battle. So taking Chinese traditional calligraphy and trying to measure it with Gestalt psychology principles is, um, of course, it's uh, too difficult. Uh, this calligraphy um, is uh, eighth century calligraphy. It also is a model in learning calligraphy, especially cursive script, as you see it here. Some scholars, like uh, Chen Zhenyan, would like to take into account the effects of the brushstroke, the effects of the strength, of rhythm, of depth, that depend on the use of brush in his general principle in the aesthetics of calligraphy, Shu Fa Mei Xue Tong Lun. But then, how to measure them and what to do with it? Other scholars have even tried to find a golden ratio for Chinese calligraphy. And this was um, uh, mainstream studies in the, in the 80s and 90s. And um, I arrived to a third point, which is emotion and brushstroke in psychology in the sense of psychoanalysis, which was mainstream in the 90s. Uh, during the, the 90s, the scholars in the field of calligraphy, I mean sinologists, professors of calligraphy, art historians, were mainly interested in psychology in the sense of psychoanalysis. This type of studies was really mainstream in China, in Chinese, as well in, in Western languages, French, English, German, although someone like Xiong Bingming clearly opposed to it. Xiong Bingming tried to analyze Chinese theory of art under a structuralist standpoint. He did not uh, agree with uh, saying so, but he did in his Zhongguo uh, Shufa Lin Tixi, Theoretical Systems of Chinese Calligraphy. In this book, he addresses insiders or even specialists of calligraphy who know about the context, which is not the case of most of Chinese readers today and, of course, obviously, not of Westerners. Anyhow, the most prominent scholar of the mainstream of studies in the field of psychoanalysis is Jean-François Bilter from Switzerland, especially in his Chinese art of writing, La Chinois de l'écriture, he speaks about the emotional expression in Chinese calligraphy of projection, of corps propre, one's own body, and he refers to the works of the French psychoanalyst Mahmoud Sami Ali. In his book, it seems Chinese calligraphy is the expression of an individual facing him or herself, which is, I assume, absolutely inaccurate. Um, 
Now, shall I explain what he, uh, try to explain the, what he means by the corps propre, one's own body? Actually, this is an expression coming from Maurice Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology, something that lives its own proper life and that doesn't depend on the perception nor on the representation. Merleau-Ponty, in Phenomenology of Perception, considers the corps propre as not being the body, the corps, as a thing or as a biological organism, that is why it indicates the body's subjectivity. It is the identity of oneself that precedes intellectual identity of the I think or of the cogito. Before thinking on oneself with the tool of thought, one already has the feeling to be a self. The corps propre is the self at the most primordial level that realizes itself through its power and sensitive possibilities. It is the I can. The corps propre must be apprehended on a double mode as a physical thing, a material matter on the one hand, and on another hand, as what I feel it and on it. In the psychosomatic resting conception, particularly in the French one, the body embodies the ego's real life. The flesh body, therefore, is an expression of the life of the spirit. It is the very essence of the expressivity of the body. In psychoanalysis, it is considered the self or the identity is not something innate and the self-unity is never something determined. Identity must go through imagination to constitute itself. But in fact, for Samieli, to whom Bilter refers all the time in his book, imagination is synonymous with projection. You can see in his, uh, this paper, Introduction à la psychosomatique. This kind of analysis is particularly inaccurate to Chinese calligraphy, not only because it is anachronistic, but because it cannot be found in calligraphic practice itself, whether it be in traditional calligraphy or in today practice. Calligraphy is not only a practice for the self, but it is a social practice too. It is not an individual art as imagined in Europe. It is, as uh, pointed out this morning by Vertoz, it is a shared experience over time and space. Even if it can express the emotions of an individual, the aim is the expression of universal emotions, as I pointed out earlier. For instance, calligraphy is as well the expression of the atmosphere or the mood of a period, of a dynasty, a calligraphy from the Jin dynasty, from the Wei dynasty, from the Tang or from the Song, which means 3rd, 8th, 11th or 15th century, can be recognized at the first glance for practitioners because it is believed it expresses different moods of different epochs. Don Titang and Mo Chelon were the first ones to theorize the evolution of categories during the successive the dynasties following their degree of expressivity in Chinese history. The Jin looked for momentum, the Tang for method, the Song for expression, the Yuan for attitude. Two okay. The Jin, well, I hope almost finished. The Jin. Um, under the Qing dynasty, Liang Yan uses the same classification and extends it to the Ming. The Jin are under momentum, the Tang method, the Song expression, the Yuan and Ming attitude. Today, calligraphers um, point out and assert the Jin on the momentum, the Tang method, the Tang Song expression, the Yuan attitude, the Ming savor, the Qing simplicity. This kind of appreciation does not concern a single calligrapher, but it means the style or the specificity of a calligraphy also expresses more or less its context. This is Jin Dynasty calligraphy, momentum. This is Tang Dynasty method. This is um, uh, Song Dynasty expression. You can see differences of in shapes in, callig in calligraphy. This is uh, uh, Yuan Dynasty attitude. This is Ming Dynasty um, 
uh, attitude, and this is the uh, Qing Dynasty saver. Now, Chinese calligraphy and writing in neuropsychology and neurolinguistics. In the field of psychology, the book written by Gao Shangren, Henry Gao, ent entitled Psychology of Calligraphy, Shu Fa Xin Li Xue, has drawn much attention because of its originality. It was the first book in Chinese to study calligraphy under the completely new standpoint of neuropsychology. Unfortunately for us, this book and the other ones this author has written are not about calligraphy as an art at all, and they do not study emotions either. Henry Gao is only interested in the usefulness of calligraphy towards the mechanical functioning of the human body. In other words, calligraphy is only perceived as a possible therapy. It's never studied as an art or as an artistic practice or considering its relationships with painting. The research concerns mainly the practice of calligraphy and not the reception of the visual effects of a brushstroke. In the book The Psychology of Calligraphy, in Chinese, Henry Gao shows, for instance, that when a patient calligraphies, his breath is more regular and his heart slower, even compared to what happens when he or she reads a book while it's seated. Therefore, the patient's blood pressure gets lower, etc. If practiced daily, calligraphy is very helpful against several chronic diseases like stress, diabetes, high blood pressure, and so on. It's sufficient also against autism, attention deficit disorders, hyperactivity disorders, Alzheimer patients, etc. You can see some papers here, you have the list of the papers. And I just want to finish in the field of psycholinguistic studies. Very interesting studies have been done in the field, not of calligraphy as the art of writing, but of, on Chinese writing and its effects on the brain, also by Henry Gao. They have been reviewed, these studies, by Viviane Alton in her L'Écriture Chinoise, Chinese Writing. Well, um, it, these studies show very clearly that uh, Chinese writing effect on the brain is exactly the same as any other writing. So I just wanted to finish on this and to say that uh, the, when the AVE project started, it was, uh, um, I think it was very, it had a reason to start with Chinese brushstroke and Chinese calligraphy. So um, thank you, Jerome. <laughs> thank you.